I will today I will actually focus more on our experiments, particularly on the European X-ray free electron laser, not all free electron lasers. Uh, but um, I think that will give you a pretty good view of the typical kind of uh, experiment that we do when trying to do single particle imaging experiments. And uh, first, I would like to talk a little bit of what we are trying to achieve and how that can be achieved in multiple ways. And uh, so one longstanding uh, goal of, uh, of scientists had been how to image single proteins. And there's, there was a seminal paper from Richard Henderson in 1995, where he compared different ways to probe uh, proteins single proteins and he came to the conclusion that given that uh, the elastic cross section for electrons is so much higher than for x-rays and also for neutrons uh, the electrons are the best way to go about to image proteins and furthermore there was less damage caused by the electrons uh, and so there's this huge gap of about 10 to the 5 in terms of the signal that one can extract from a single electron compared to a single x-ray Roughly, I mean, depends on the exact energies and so on, but about this order of magnitude. And this has given rise to this uh, cryo EM resolution revolution uh, that gave rise to a Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. And it's exploding all around the world with EM machines popping out everywhere and, uh, and uh, spectacular work being done. So, uh, but uh, we're here, I guess, to talk about X rays. So, wh where, where do the X rays come in? So cryo-EM can do, uh, like I said, spectacular work, uh, but in terms of time-resolved imaging, it is difficult to go to very short time resolutions, given the time that it takes to freeze the sample, and just be also because you cannot really put a lot of electrons all bunched up together due to the space charge effects. And so you're typically limited to time resolutions on the order of several milliseconds, like tens of milliseconds. In principle, uh, we would also like to look at things that are faster because many biological processes are faster. There are many domain motions which take on them are on the microsecond level or to very few milliseconds, and then even faster loop motions and other kinds of motions uh, take place at faster time scales. So how can we try to to look at this? How can we investigate this? And uh, X-ray free electron lasers might provide an idea using this uh, this concept of diffraction before destruction, which has been popularized in this paper from the two thousands where one can use a short pulse on the femtosecond scale to outrun most of the radiation damage and so obtain a diffraction pattern from the relatively undisturbed sample, even though the sample will inevitably explode given the amount of energy that's deposited into it. And so you're, you're just making, taking advantage of this uh, time difference, this inertia that exists to try to obtain some more information about the sample. So you're just making use of this difference between the speed of light and the speed of the shockwave. So the dream would then be to, one can go with whatever sample you want, you just put it into the X-ray beam, you capture a diffraction pattern from it, and then you just repeat this again and again and again. So you obtain thousands or millions of diffraction patterns such that you can improve your signal to noise uh, by combining them. And uh, you furthermore have the challenge that you do not know the orientation of each individual particle. So you have to, very much like in electron microscopy and in single particle cryo EM, you have to figure out what is the relative orientation of every single particle. And then you will assemble the 3D Fourier space corresponding to the intensities that you have measured, but now are assembled in 3D. And then you will phase that and you will obtain the structure of interest and all using ultra-fast pulses, such that in principle, you are able to achieve ultra-fast time resolution. And the, the first experiments were done in quite large samples, uh, at least when one thinks about the proteins. So they were done on this mimivirus around 400 nanometers, 450 nanometers uh, in diameter, which are extremely giant. Uh, they're giant viruses, very large for a typical virus. These are more normal sized viruses, let's say. And uh, they gave a uh, beautiful diffraction at the LCLS and they were reconstructed. Um, and this all worked very well. Um, 
surprisingly well, given that it was kind of the first experiments that we've done on a, on a real free X-ray free electron laser. Uh, but then we wanted to try to progress this to go to smaller and smaller particles. And one of the first ones that we tried were these 100 nanometer carboxysomes, which are some cell organelles from, from uh, certain uh, photosynthetic uh, cells. And uh, they are supposed to be icosahedron. So they, 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 are, they have a certain amount of heterogeneity, but they are roughly icosahedral. And when we try to deliver them to the X-ray beam, we got, uh, and then we tried to reconstruct the resulting diffraction patterns. We got a bunch of things that look like this, which not only they look mostly like spheres, they also have a very large span of sizes, much larger than the natural variation of the carboxysomes. So maybe there could be something wrong with sample preparation and so on, but uh, we, we actually had quite a lot of experience already preparing these samples. So that, that was something else going on. And uh, the most likely explanation is that to be able to deliver our, our particles, in this case, the carboxysomes to the X-ray interaction region, what we do is we start with a solution and then we create an aerosol of small droplets. And then the, those aerosol droplets will dry out and you will end up with your sample. But the problem is if there is some contamination within the orig original solution, and when you're working with biological samples, it is hard to avoid having some contamination those contaminants will then uh, also deposit somewhere, those that are not volatile. So they will either cause, create these small clusters of contaminants or they will deposit on top of the sample of interest. And this is what we thought that had happened. And so to try to investigate this, we developed some laser scattering uh, to be able to measure the sizes of the droplets that we generate. And uh, we did this first using the traditional method that we have been we have been using for several years called gas dynamic virtual nozzles, and this was this gave a quite broad size range in terms of the droplet that you get. So you can see everywhere from five hundred nanometers to one and a half micron, and this is relatively large. We would like to have smaller droplets, and to do that, we then changed to electrospray, which gives us a much more monodispersed droplet sizes of around one hundred and fifty nanometers in size. So that was much better. And then we were able to repeat the experiment using an electrospray as a source of the, the to, to generate the droplets. And using the same kind of preparation for the carboxysomes, we gave we got these much, much better looking diffraction patterns. And you can see the reconstructions, they look much more like a cosahedron. So that's that seems to have uh, solved the one of the main difficulties in trying to go for smaller and smaller particles which was getting a sample delivery method that could work with small particles. And we actually even managed the TL cells first to look at uh, some relatively small viruses. So this is 35 nanometer tomato bushy stunt virus. And uh, this is what we were expecting to have. This is the measurements that we got and they match pretty well. So we were, and here we have, for example, the case of some, so when you have two virus in the same droplet and when they dry out, they, they just, get stuck together and you see this kind of interference between the two small virus. And before we always got some balls which are larger than the size of the virus that we were expecting. So that worked fine. So if now that we could see this, we then wanted to go um, and be a bit more ambitious. So if we can see 35 nanometer viruses, can we go for single proteins? And the first experiment that we did was to look at Rubisco at the LCLS. And this was at the AMO beamline, uh, the soft X-ray beamline. And this is the kind of patterns that we're getting. Like you can see this, this module was kind of bad, so you couldn't really read any data from it. But otherwise, the main issue was that we had quite a lot of, first, the signal was very weak that we were expecting to get. And it was very hard to distinguish the natural beamline background from any kind of uh, coherent scattering signal. So, the result was inconclusive. We don't know if we were able to see any kind of protein scattering or not. Uh, at the same time, we also started to develop ways to, to quantitative, quant quantitize the amount of fluence that we're getting on each of the particles that were being hit. And we could see that we had 
Uh, for example, this is from uh, an experiment in 2012 at the AMO. By looking here at uh, basically at the intensity of the central speckle and modeling the particles as spheroids, we can, and knowing the density of the particles, we can estimate how many X-rays are shining on the particle. And this was about 10 to the 11 photons per square micron. Uh, and even going to nanofocus at CXI, so harder X-rays, we got below still one millijoule per square micron, which is uh, one might think is relatively low, given that the free electron lasers produce multiple millijoules of pulse energy. And here we're supposed to be on a nanofocus beamline with a focal spot, which is definitely below a micron. So why do we get so few, um, so few photons on the sample? That's, uh, well, th there are many losses. That seems to be the main explanation, but that was always a little bit frustrating. And when we started, when simulating uh, diffraction patterns with these kind of parameters, this is, for example, what we were expecting to get from the single Rubisco at AMO. You can see, you basically can only see the central speckle, which can be very hard to distinguish from beamline background, and you can't really see anything else. So it's hard to, to know for sure what you're actually seeing. But using uh, parameters from the SQS beamline at European XFL, uh, or what, what we, an educated guess on the, the realistic parameters we're gonna get, which was about 300 microjoules per square micron and at one kV, we were expecting that we would be able to see some fringes from uh, Rubisco. And so that we would be able to positively identify that we were getting a Rubisco on the beam. And then we started, and now the, the European XFL started, uh, and we were able to actually do experiments. But first, we were only able to run things at SPB. And one of the important things to try to check was whether one could actually use the high repetition rate, uh, this very special pulse structure of the European XFL, which has pulses that can come with a one megahertz repetition rate within a train, and then a very long time without any x-rays between different pulse strains. So could this kind of pulse structure be used to do single particle imaging experiments? And the expectation was yes, but we had to confirm this experimentally. And the first experiment, uh, we had, a, as you can see, very bad focal spot. So 15 microns, we had to use a rather large sample. Again, we used this MIMI virus that were used for the first LCLS experiments. And uh, we were only interested in checking whether the, the separation between consecutive hits uh, in the train followed what you'd expect for completely independent hits, or there was some kind of, uh, some kind of influence of one hit on the, next, on the following hits, for example. It could be that if you hit one sample, then that caused the breeze that would stay around and would prevent the second sample from being hit in the following uh, pulse. But that, that was not the case, or at least we could not see this from the, from the hit rates that we, that we measured. They seem, to, they seem to match perfectly what you'd expect from ideally uh, independent hits. So that was good, but that was also roughly expected. So with, uh, with that out of the way, then we could start to go to the uh, to running experiments at this uh, soft X-ray beamline uh, with really small samples. So the first one we started was with this uh, E. coli ribosome. That's a E. coli 70S ribosome, about 20 nanometers in size. And in previous experiments, it was like I said, hard to to look at to see these very small samples. Not only because the signal was low, but also because we had these depositions. But here we managed to obtain multiple, uh, quite, quite a, a large number of hits, given that uh, at this first experiment, we were limited actually to a detector that was a PNCCD that could only acquire one pulse per train. So uh, we were uh, limited at most to 10 Hertz, even though in theory, the European XFL can go all the way to 27 kilohertz, but um, we were detector limited. So Still, we managed to obtain this nice looking histogram that matched perfectly the size that you would expect for the ribosome. And that was quite encouraging. So then we went one step further in the same experiment with, we, 
we replaced the ribosome by this GROEL, uh, which is a, it's a chaperone that, uh, that has a, an interesting shape. So it has a cylinder-like shape, while many proteins can be quite globular. And so they can be hard to distinguish from, for example, a droplet. This one in a certain direction looks more like a rectangle. And so that makes it more distinguishable compared to some kind of uh, some kind of impurity, which tends to form round shaped droplets. And when we when we started to inject, we, we managed to obtain this diffraction pattern that you can see here in the middle, which first, now it is clearly very different from the background that we're getting. The background here is on the right hand side. So we can see there's clearly something in the beam. And furthermore, with some more more detailed analysis so i can see ah so you, you might notice that this thing first is not com not completely round it has some kind of it looks like it has some kind of squarish edges in some directions uh, but this image was quite a lot of contaminated also by uh, it, by the fluorescence from carbon dioxide and nitrogen that we are using to deliver the, the particles to the interaction region and if we actually do a histogram of the values that you get in our PNCCT, you can see there's this the zero photon peak corresponding to pixels without any X-rays. And then you have this bump here corresponding to fluorescent photons. And then only here you have the bump corresponding to elastically scattered photons. So we, given that this detector has such a nice or such low noise, uh, such a nice energy resolution, we were able to simply discard all the pixels that contain fluorescent photons and only keep the elastically scattered photons. Uh, but we still had a decent amount of background, a large amount of background, let's say, coming from elastically scattered photons on the gas that was used to deliver the sample to the interaction region. So the, the left-hand side here shows an image of the detector when we were not, deli we were not delivering sample to the interaction region meaning that there was no CO2 and no nitrogen. So this is the purely from scattering on from elements within the beamline, and that was only 65 photons per shot. When we turn on the gas, we get 17,000 photons per shot, uh, and that's only the elastically scattered photons. There's even more the fluorescent photons, which uh, in the end makes it so that you only get a, an increase of about a factor of two when you actually have a hit of the the single protein, the GRL. So that's one area where we're definitely working, trying to reduce this background. And there are a bunch of ideas on how to do this. But uh, we still had to, to know whether what we hit was actually a GRL. And to do this, we simply compare the, the diffraction data that we got to the well-known X-ray uh, crystal structure and also cryo-EM structure for GRL. And they actually matched remarkably well. So. Here on the left-hand side, you have the GROEL, the experimental data. Here we have on the right-hand side, the crystal structure of GROEL. And uh, here in C, we have just, if you take the crystal structure and then you try to calculate the diffraction pattern in the same geometry as we were doing the experiment. And then if on top of it, you add the experimental gas background that we measured, then we end up with things that are quite similar. But uh, if we went and digged a little bit deeper, we saw that the, the match was actually not, not perfect or, or not even that good, regardless of the orientation of the GRL. And you can see here, just on the small angle scattering pattern, just by as muscle integration of the signal, if uh, we just take the, the, the data and compare it to the PDB, then the PDB, always has a much larger bump here in this region, uh, in this Q range. And this bump actually comes from the, the hole that exists through the GRL. So we, we, we thought about it and it is very likely that when we inject the, so when you start with GRL in solution and then it dries out, uh, that it doesn't dry out completely, but it's still, well, there's still some water that is kept that is stuck within the hole through the cylinder. And besides the water, there might also be protein, for example, which is well known to, to stay there 
uh, within, uh, for, for example, also in cryo EM um, reconstructions. So we tried to add density there. And in, when we added some density, some water molecules within the hole, then we got a much better agreement between the experimental data here in green and the, the, the model, sorry, the experimental data in blue and the model in green. And now they agree very nicely. So we are very convinced that uh, what we have is a Gruyel with a filled cylinder in the, in the middle and filled probably with a mixture of water and protein and some salt maybe. So that, that was uh, unexpected, but uh, interesting. So this is our best model fit. And uh, we actually just last week uh, or two weeks ago, actually, now we've posted the paper, a manuscript uh, to bioarchive uh, showing all of these results and also with some cryo EM reconstructions on, of the same data or on the same sample showing that what we we're injecting was GROEL. Um, so uh, I would encourage if you're interested to take a look uh, at the paper. But so now that we can kind of show that we are able to, to take a glimpse, get a glimpse of a single protein, how many photons do we really need to mix, get a useful structure with useful resolution to, to do biology? And if you, uh, if you look at papers from cryo-EM, people have come up with different minimal doses, but this is one of them. And this corresponds to about 1.5 electrons per square angstrom to, to get some uh, around three angstrom resolution uh, in some uh, the, the limiting case. If we take into account the fact that there's this large discrepancy in the scattering cross-section between X-rays and photons, sorry, between X-rays and electrons, then that would that would correspond to about 1.5 times 10 to the 13 photons per square micron. If we look at the paper that I showed in the beginning from showing the idea of this diffraction before destruction, this Neutze et al. from 2000, the, that paper had simulations with number of photons on the order of four times 10 to the 14 photons per square micron. So it was quite a bit above this minimal cryo-EM dose. And so it was not strange that it was possible to get nice results with that. If we now compare this to the experimental experimentally measured fluencies, for example, nanofocus at CXI at the LCLS, we are about still an order of 15 times under the, this cryo-EM minimal resolution. Or if you compare to the Neutze et al, then it's almost 400 times that we are uh, below that, uh, that estimate of the 10 to three, four times 10 to the 14. So in some sense, uh, very real sense, XFL still are weak. Uh, and they haven't really managed to achieve the power that had been proposed uh, or expected when the, this paper in 2000 was proposed. But, uh, but things are improving. So uh, recently at the, at the SPB beam line at the European XFL, we have man managed to measure fluencies for the first time above this one millijoule per square micron barrier that we had never been able to cross before. Uh, and actually, so these are, it, it's just a bunch of hits on sugar balls, but uh, you can see that you have not only above one millijoule, but we have some of, some of them above 10 millijoules. So uh, that's encouraging. And uh, it seems to show that, uh, that at the SPB beam line, at least at the time when we, were, we did this experiment, we had a true nano focus, uh, focus and that the amount of X-rays getting there uh, or the, the loss through the beamline was relatively low. So this puts us at a more interesting position. So the, the first experiment uh, where I showed the GROEL was only about a factor of three below this minimal cryo-EM that was required. If you take into account the fact that also the soft X-rays have a higher scattering cross-section. And this nanofocus measurement at, uh, at SPB SFX is very close to this minimal uh, dose. So things really are improving. And actually, uh, just recently at the, at the European XFL users meeting, there was uh, uh, an announcement that they managed to obtain 17 millijoules uh, per pulse at soft X-rays, which is about a factor of three higher than what we had when we did this experiment. So they are able to push the not only the pulse energy, but also probably more importantly, the focusing conditions and the, the transmission through the beamline. 
uh, and also the, the background level. So that's also very important. So things are improving uh, significantly. Uh, so I think that uh, that in the future, and also using higher repetition rate detectors such that we can acquire much more data, we might really be able to get some uh, high resolution biologically significant data on single proteins. And just to give you an idea of the of the path that we already went through, we started with this MIMI virus that are in the order of 450 nanometer, like I said, and we're now looking at things that are tiny like this, uh, GROEL, which are definitely tiny, especially if you think that what matters is the volume and not just the area of the, of the object in question. And finally, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, a bunch of people that uh, have been working together to, to make these experiments a success. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Felipe. And I have to admit that you are the first <laughs> person of this series who actually um, stuck to time that it declared the beginning. So congratulations, <laughs> <laughs> you did it. Uh, so thanks for, for this, this talk. And uh, now it's open for questions, comments from the audience. So you can either raise your hand or directly unmute yourself or write uh, questions in the chat if you prefer. I don't see anything yet. So I think I will start to, um, to ask you some questions. I, I have no experience whatsoever in, in, in this type of uh, uh, physics in, in some of, of science. You were saying that um, there is a, um, a minimum flux that you need uh, to, uh, to retrieve yes. information needed. Can you tell me what is the actually information you are looking for when you are looking at these proteins and the small so, proteins? What is the quantitative information that you would like to have with X-rays? So, well, I think there are, there are a couple of points there. For, first, maybe just trying to understand why there is a minimal dose required, it might be an interesting point to, to just to mention is that first you need to be able to not only and see whether you have something in the beam or you don't have something in the beam. And this is actually a, the, the in, in when you're talking, for example, to people in electron microscopy, this is called the particle picking problem. Whether you have a particle there or you don't have a particle there sometimes can be hard to, to, to tell. So that's the first limitation. So you need enough signal to be able to say whether there's something in the beam. And then you also need enough signal to know what is the orientation, because I, I mentioned that the orientation of the particles is unknown. And so we have to be able to orient them relative to each other to be able to, in the end, <clears throat> recover these three-dimensional intensities. And to be able to orient them, you also need a certain amount of signal. If you have uh, no photons, you're, there's no way you are going to be able to understand what is the orientation of that. So that's the first part. Then you're saying what kind of information that you want to see. So the, the kind of information that we got in this experiment uh, from the from the GROEL only allows you to to say very gives you only very low resolution features. So we can say what is the size, the overall size of the particle, which uh, matches the part the, the size of GROEL. We can also see, for example, that it, it, even though we, it seems that this cylinder, but that's because we already have a model for, for the, the particle. It seems to, to, to be a filled particle, so it does not seem to be a hollow particle. But these are all uh, features that are on the order of 10 nanometer or something like that, or maybe a little bit below, but not much more. Uh, and uh, people would be interested in features that are definitely sub nanometer. Uh, and, uh, and for that, we are still uh, far away. We definitely cannot do it from a single picture. We would need to be able to average out multiple diffraction patterns to increase our signal to noise and, and extend the resolution to uh, something that, that can, be, can be used then to, to obtain some biological insights about what the protein is doing. Uh, and how it does what it does. So uh, could you please uh, tell me what is the comparison between the data that you take with the cryo-EM, for example, what is, 
what are the difficulties of analyzing such small particles with cryo em so for example this this kind of uh, sample the gruel is uh, is more or less a standard uh, i would say for for cryo em particularly some time ago it was more of a standard nowadays there are smaller uh, like apoferritin that's much more used as a standard but but it, it's it's relatively straightforward to uh, to to analyze these and, and obtain thousands of of projection images from from gruel and use it to to recover a high resolution structure so that's uh, uh, that's not a large not a big challenge and th that's one of the reasons why we picked this particle because it's uh, it is well so not only are there good studies on crystallography and cryo em people has also done studies using uh, electro uh, mass spectrometry and using electrospray ionization as a method of sample delivery and and so we knew that this was going to be compatible with uh, which we also use for our experiment and we knew that the, the sample would behave uh, it, that it was well characterized and so uh, we felt safe in using it Okay. Any other questions and comments from the audience? So, Felipe, it seems to me you've, you've gone quite quickly and uh, uh, in a fascinating way through this detailing at the beginning of your talk, but it looks like this data sorting is, is solved. Basically, you, you have it in your hand. Left I, mean, I, I think it, so. So there's also been actually some uh, improvements in the kind of data sorting, especially when one is trying to. So in, in the ideal case where all the particles are the same, I would say that this is almost solved. I mean, it depends on the kind of signal to noise you have, but uh, but it's a well understood problem. But in reality, the particles are not the particles. They are not all the same. There is variation uh, within your, your sample. There are also variations in the experimental conditions. You might not, they're not, might not be perfectly stable, particularly at free electron lasers, things are not very stable typically. And, um, and so there will be variation and how you, you're able to handle and sort this variation is a more open question. And it, it's not even just for, in the case of uh, single particle CDI, it, it, it's, uh, I think it's a general issue uh, for structural biology, for example, that uh, people first start to study the more well-behaved, well-ordered systems, which are easier to study. And then one wants to go to less well-behaved systems and things start to get more complicated. But people are able to start to deal with some of this complication. And uh, there was a recent paper uh, by uh, Kartik Iyer on, on melting uh, melting gold nanoparticles, where the idea was to just image nanoparticles of gold in different with different shapes, but uh, it just happened that during the experiment, the the the, the previous pulse before the, before the pulse gets to the before the particle gets to the interaction region, the pulse that arrived just before the tails of it was actually sometimes melting the particle. So you end up with some diffraction patterns of the particle without being melted and some of them sometimes were melted so the the particles were definitely not uniform some of them were half melted and he was able to properly separate and classify these things so it's a it's a one initial step in this way towards the heterogeneity of the sample which was something we're going to have to deal with in the future i see oscar uh, raise his hands can you please unmute yourself oscar Oh yes, thank you, and um, thank you so much for the for the talk. Week. It was really, I mean, it's hard not to get excited about how much has happened since the first hard X-ray expose came online, uh, especially in these kind of fields. So I have a question, a bit related to what we just discussed before about resolutions and heterogeneity and, and all these topics. So, so I mean, how much is similar to the cryo field? I mean, like when you had these cryo trapping situations instead, I'm, I'm thinking like when you go to higher resolutions and have more, I mean, more heterogeneity uh, between molecules in this. So. So is this a very equivalent problem to the cryo EM single particle field, or do you have differences given how the sample is treated before when you're injecting it in this, like in terms of sample handling up until the extra interaction, like in terms of temperatures and whatnot? Like, uh... I mean, the, the 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 details of the sample delivery are clearly very different, but the problem, fundamental problem is exactly the same, that you will not have data coming from always a consistent particle, but from uh, a particle in different states. And so you will end up 
you will have to do something to be able to make use of data that uh, that doesn't match your simple initial model to, to start with, that we're always looking at one particle just in different orientations. And it's not just the orientation that changes, it's a bunch of other things, but uh, you, they are still related. So it's not like you end up with random stuff in the beam uh, that, that because that you couldn't do anything with. Uh, so there's some kind of continuum be between having a always homogeneous sample and having a completely heter heterogeneous sample and you're you're a little bit somewhere in the middle and you have to make use of that and, and make the best use of, of the data you can. Thank you. And just to add quickly, I, for example, we, we, we will probably be able to make use of some of the algorithms that people are using, developing for cryo-EM and, and also anything that we can develop probably can also be used for, for cryo-EM. So it's a, it's a two-way uh, situation where we can both make use of things. I see Karina is ready for a question. Karina, go ahead. Uh, hi, I will leave my video off. I'm doing this on my mobile, so I don't want it to collapse. Hello. Um, my question, uh, thanks for the talk. I, I really, I loved it um, a lot. Um, my question is a little bit uh, going on from Oscar's, uh, I guess. So when you had the last one, this uh, Grow EL uh, that you said was in all cases was filled, so, and previously also with the other um, uh, sample you had that it, it agglomerated on the outside some, some extra particles. So how much of a problem is, is it then when you want to go away from what you already know? Uh, so as you said, like these structures in principle, they are already known. Um, how can you then rely on your uh, sample prep or the, at least the delivery methods? Did, was this electrospray as well? The the yes. gray okay, okay. The gray yellow was electrospray, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that is a good question, and um, the fact that there is stuff within uh, within the cylinder of the or the, the the hollow cylinder of the structure of the gray yellow is not necessarily a problem. If it's uh, water and protein, for example, is actually uh, you might say it's good because it's uh, we want there to be water. We do not want the, the so unlike when you're doing a uh, mass spectrometry, for example, a kind of experiment where you, you're relying on the mass, here we don't really rely on the mass of the, uh, of the sample. We, we, can, we can look at it and then make the conclusions from that. And we would like to have a little bit of water around the sample because it, we, we don't want it to, to, we want it to be in as native state as possible, given that it's in gas phase. Um, so the, the fact that there is water is not necessarily a problem. If there are other things there, and there likely is, so for example, there might be protein. And we actually, when we did some, we, we did some cryo-EM on the sample that we had, and we saw that many of the particles did have some protein within the, the cylinder. So it's possible that this one also had. That might be uh, more problematic, even though, again, in, in vivo, the Groyal will very often have protein. I mean, that's what it does. So it, it, it's not strange that it has proteins uh, within the cylinder. Other things like salts and other things that might accumulate when the water evaporates, that might be more problematic because that might be, that is something, high concentrations of salt is not something that you naturally have in vivo. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so that uh, that would be a problem, and we are continuing to work on improving our sample delivery conditions and trying to um, trying to understand better. One, one interesting thing, though, was that it is uh, it is known from mass spec that that Goyal uh, often collapses uh, when it is uh, when it's delivered by uh, by electrospray. In this case, we did not see that happening. Uh, which is positive, I would say. So it, it looks more like the solution structure, but we're clearly not in solution. Uh, but we, we, we will have to work more with this problem. And I think it's, uh, like you say, we have to be aware uh, of uh, what happens to our sample when we, when we deliver it to the beam. Thanks. Oscar. I just want to ask more on the, on the infrastructure side. I mean, away from the science, I mean, with a bit like on the topic of Dina with the data sorting and, and this, and, and when you're mentioning the European Excel and eventually making use of all those 27 kilohertz pulses and such, 
I mean, how do you see the computing infrastructure like? And um, I mean, and, and I mean, dealing with these kind of molecular movies on storage and computing side, like, uh, I mean, sort of, is it already kind of a growing concern, or is it sort of still some buffer until it becomes a major problem to actually deal with the data rates uh, coming out of these facilities? I think for many people, this is already a, a real issue. For us, for our particular experiment, it hasn't yet become a real issue because our uh, hit rates or the percentage of X-ray pulses that actually hit sample for us is relatively small. So we can throw away a lot of the recorded data and so only concentrate on the good part. But uh, there are ideas, for example, to do, I don't know if you're familiar with vetoing capabilities of detectors where you would give a signal to, because currently the detectors are only able to 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 to, to record a fraction of the pulses that the European XFL can produce. But uh, in, in theory, the, the detectors have the capability that if you tell them which pulses you want to record, uh, and you can do that, for example, by looking at the ions that, that uh, for example, having an ion time of flight sensor that measures, uh, you can measure protons, that would be relatively fast. And so tell the detector, okay, this time we actually hit something. And so keep this frame um, that would dramatically increase how much data we would get. And, and then, and also as we will improve the sample delivery methods. So we're improving on increasing our heat rates and so on and, and improving our focusing methods for the particles. This will probably at some point become a serious problem. Yes. Thank you. But we're just hoping the crystallographers will fix it before we get there. Any other questions, comments from the audience? I, I think this is uh, was lightly touched before. Uh, Felipe, what is the heat rate? You didn't you didn't say what, what is the... it, it? It varies a lot, but uh, it. Uh, so, for example, in the case of the Groyel, uh, it, well, it's a little bit hard to say because many of the heats were, were weak, but it's on the order of about one percent. Uh, when I showed the sucrose particles where we measure this intense heat, uh, it can sometimes go for sucrose, it can sometimes go almost to 100% depending on the focusing conditions. Uh, but for most biological particles, I would say like around 1% is a more realistic uh, value, meaning okay. that you hit one out of 100 pulses. Okay. So I see uh, Prasenjit as a uh, racist hand, please. Thank you. Um, excuse this very naive question. I'm actually an astronomer and wondering if uh, if there might be anything uh, um, uh, in common from uh, as a as an inversion problem. And the question is: um, uh, Do you always have to have a model for the structure that uh, that that you're probing, or is it possible to go directly from the observable by some? Uh, under the under the inversion method to work out the structure. It, it, it is definitely possible to to do direct inversion of the data. It just the, the reason why we did not do it in this case is because we knew what was the sample what what we were delivering and we I mean there is this high quality structures available so we just wanted to to see whether it matched with what we our expectation. But in the initial examples where I showed these mimi viruses large viruses. Um, these 450 nanometers done at VLCLS, there we did the full inversion without any assumptions about the data and uh, about the sample. And you can also do inversions with partial assumptions. For example, you can do symmetry assumptions and other kinds of assumptions uh, on the on, on your sample. So yeah, you're absolutely uh, right that you could we, you could do this in this case in this particular case. Given the low resolution, uh, we could we can still do this. It will mostly give us a blob. Uh, that's uh, the result. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other raised hands. Uh, I think we can we can uh, conclude. There is uh, there may be many many other questions that can come up to mind. I don't know. I, we still have another minute. If anyone wants. Otherwise, we can conclude. Philippe, thank you so much for your talk and for participating in this series. 
And uh, yeah, I hope to see everyone uh, to the next uh, appointment is the 7th of April with Ivan Vartanians. Thank you again.